Welcome to This Is Money podcast. I'm Georgie Frost and joining me and editor Simon Lambert today is Pensions and Investments editor Tanya Jeffries. And coming up, are we nearly there yet? Rates go up again, the tenth rise on the bounce. So when will the Bank of England give it a rest? Also today, our tenure exposes a new state pension failure. We take a look at what kind of ISA is right for you. It's getting more important. And the great tumble dryer debate rumbles on. Don't forget you can stay up to date with all the latest breaking money news. Just go to thisismoney.co.uk or download the app. The This Is Money podcast, in partnership with eToro, your multi-asset social investing platform. Want to learn more about the latest financial news straight from the analysts themselves? Tune in to Digest and Invest, the podcast by eToro, for weekly bite-sized updates for anyone interested in trading and investing. The Digest and Invest podcast, available on all your regular podcast platforms. But first, the Bank of England upped the base rate this week for the 10th time on the trot, from 3.5% to 4%, the highest level in over 14 years. Not a unanimous decision. Two members voted to hold rates where they are. It's all in a bid, of course, to curb inflation, so we're told. Is it working, though? And what does it mean for us and our money? Simon, Tanya, welcome. Simon, the latest move, your thoughts. 4%. I'll hold my hands up so anybody doesn't have to listen back to all the episodes of the podcast where I said this. I didn't think they'd get this high. I didn't think the Bank of England would manage to make it to 4%. I thought they would have to stop before they got here. But I don't think many people expected rates to rocket up into the air like they have done. It's astonishing when you consider the decade and more of ultra low interest rates after the financial crisis, the pathological fear of raising interest rates, despite the fact that there were many occasions when we could have done so, the fact that interest rates were cut to an emergency level one, two, three times. The first was an emergency half a percent. The next one was an emergency 0.25% for the Brexit vote. And then we had the emergency 0.1%. And after each of those emergencies, we were so scared about getting interest rates back up off the floor that we left it a really, really long time. And this time around, we got caught out and inflation came barreling in. Inflation, that, in all honesty, has very little to do with whether interest rates in this country are at 0.1% or 10%. Wouldn't have made the slightest difference to the um, energy, food, inflation, Ukraine war stuff that we were importing. But the Bank of England isn't raising interest rates to deal with that. That 10.5% CPI inflation that we've got caused by all those things is in the past. It doesn't matter what it does with interest rates now. That's already happened. What it's doing is it's raising interest rates to try and stop inflation in the future to send a signal to businesses to people to everybody you know hey don't ask for these big pay rises don't be thinking you can give these big pay rises we are going to be tough on inflation we are going to bring prices down it's all about trying to get into people's heads and make them think that inflation is going to come down now in theory that's going to work because the bank of england forecasts that inflation is going to drop all the way down to three percent uh come the end of this year And that probably is going to happen because it's just simple mathematics that if this spike drops out because energy prices aren't continuing to go up at the rate they were, food prices are still going up a lot, though, then you'll see inflation drop. It doesn't mean things will get cheaper. 4%, is that it? Maybe, might be. The consensus in the Bank of England report of forecasts is to get to 4.5%. There's some debate as to whether they do that in one go or whether we get quarter point rises from here, another 0.25% and then another 0.25%. Some people are suggesting 4.25 is the top and others are saying we might already be there. They might not raise again. I think they'll probably give us at least one more just for just for good measure. Uh, But what I do think this entire endeavour illustrates is that, you know, 2020 hindsight thing, but we really should have raised interest rates long before we started raising interest rates on any one of those occasions that I mentioned just now. What difference really would it have made? Just explain to me what my life would be looking like right now, Simon. I don't think that we would, I don't think the inflation would have been as bad. Um, Obviously we imported a lot of this inflation, but we didn't, it's not all, that's not only what's going on. And I think that if central banks 
the major central banks had made a concerted effort to say, do you know what? Actually, I don't think that we should have interest rates at near zero for a very prolonged period of time. And this is causing major distortions in global financial markets, Mm -hmm. which is abundantly obvious to anybody with an iota of sense. And perhaps we should start trying to get these off the floor. Then I think it would probably have helped out in maybe at least stemming a bit of that inflationary wave that we've suffered. But it also would have stalled some of the other problems that we've seen, the bubbles that have been blown. I mean, inflation is a problem, right? But house price inflation is totally mental um, in this country. House prices are way, way, way above wages. It's totally out of whack. It's one of the biggest problems we face in this country. And it doesn't just impact people buying a house. It impacts people's financial decisions in the rest of their life. It impacts people's decisions whether to start a business. We are less entrepreneurial as a country because the chunk of people who would be out there starting businesses, taking risks, don't do it because they're in their 30s and their 40s and they just cannot afford not to be able to pay that mortgage or not to have that deposit for a house and so on and so on. Uh, Stock markets, completely bananas. Not the FTSE 100, although that's done quite well recently. But, you know, the the, the tech boom, the yeah, Tesla shares, all that kind of stuff. You know, just completely bananas. The crypto market, all of this kind of stuff. There's, there's mad stuff that's been going on all over the place mm. to do with cheap money, too cheap money over the past year and a half. And, you know, maybe we'll look back on that kind of like pandemic property boom as the peak of the madness the bit where you where a combination of itchy feet a sort of stamp duty holiday vibe going on and fixed mortgage rates below one percent saw everybody go totally nuts and start paying way over the odds for properties i don't know or maybe actually we'll just have a little lull and then we'll go back to normal and it'll start going straight back up in the air but it is just like one little snapshot of the craziness that low interest rates for too long has caused. And unfortunately, there was a generation paying the price for this who were assured by central bankers that when rates went up, they would go up slowly and gradually and there would be plenty of forward guidance. Remember that. And that's not what's happened. And you've got people uh, suddenly discovering that they're going to have to find another £500 a month for their mortgage. And that is going to really, really impact their finances. And this is another example of generational um, you know, intergenerational unfairness, um, because, you know, it's having a really bad impact on this generation that has already had to pay incredibly high prices for properties. Now, what I would say is the generation above them suffered the pain of the 19, early 1990s, you know, when everybody was on floating rate mortgages and interest rates shot up. But the, the better thing was that they didn't pay as much for those houses in the first place, particularly when you compared it to wages. So Tanya, it's all the fault of the Bank of England, basically. But inflation is expected to hit 3% by 2024. So that is also the fault of the Bank of England, whose policy now is getting inflation down, right? I mean, you know, no, is that not how it works? Uh, well, yes, a- Andrew Bailey did a round of interviews uh, yesterday, as he always does when these decisions were made. The gist of of it really was that he thinks that we're approaching the turning point, the corner around which we might turn, but he's not completely sure we're right there yet. I think that means that, as Simon said, we might get another interest rate rise, but they're now beginning to think about putting the brakes on, which will be welcome. It is likely that inflation is going to start easing, um, especially um, towards the middle of next year when it's an annual figure. So the effect of the previous year starts falling out of the, the figures Um, And I don't think that can come before time because um, there is some analysis that all the savings that people built up during the pandemic, um, which, you know, they've been using up to, you know, keep their heads above water while inflation has been raging. They're going to start running out of that around April time. But if that coincides, hopefully, with inflation starting to ease, even though prices won't actually go down, let's hope they stop going up, that will be welcome. We have to see. He seemed very tentative in welcoming good news, but there were indications that we might finally, finally be reaching a point where we can look ahead with a bit more optimism. 
Uh, Simon, how's this going to affect us? Will fixed rate mortgages go up? Will banks increase savings rates? What, what, what am I expecting for my money? Well, we're in an interesting position here. Both mortgage rates and fixed rate savings raced ahead of the Bank of England decisions after the mini budget caused the little mini financial crisis. Um, And we saw bond markets have a wobble, financial markets view of the UK have a wobble and banks and building societies have a major wobble and pull their mortgage rates and then put them back on the market at much, much higher levels. And the average fixed rate mortgage, two-year fix and five-year fix peaked above 6.5% in October. Now, bear in mind that that figure was about 2.5% a year ago, and you can see there's quite a large difference there. But what also happened was savings rates went up. Um, banks and building societies dramatically accelerated the, the rates they were offering, particularly on fixed rate savings, one, two, three-year bonds. In easy access savings rates have gone up as well, but maybe not as much. What's happened actually recently over the past month and a half or so is that mortgage rates have, start, have started to come down. So you're looking at average rates of now about five and a half percent, maybe a bit lower than that. And the best deals are now knocking around four percent. But also fixed rate savings have come down slightly as well. And it's a strange situation to be in where the Bank of England is raising interest rates. And we've had two rises over this period. We've had the December one. We've had the one this week. And you're actually watching mortgage rates come down and fixed rate savings come down. The question is now whether we've kind of reached an inflection point where those things start going back up again. I don't think necessarily we'll see much of an upwards movement in mortgage rates unless we see more than half a percent added to the base rate if we see the half a percent that's expected or the 0.25 percent that lots of people expect i think we'll probably see mortgage rates stick round about where they are now they might come down a bit lower you've got to remember banks and building societies are really quite well capitalized and they're eager to lend and they want to make profits so there is competition in the market and it's not just what the bank of england does it's the competition in the market that affects rates too and when we saw them spike in september and october competition in the market had done one out the window didn't even take its coat um so we've seen that return but there's also some competition in the savings market and that was what we were seeing with rates going up then because banks and building sites were going well we're going to get some cash in we're going to get some cash in now there's maybe a little bit less of that competition but we did see three easy access savings rate rises yesterday after the base rate decision which is good news. I I think the thing that people need to remember is if your mortgage fixed rate is coming up from renewal at any point this year, you need to start looking into it now. And even if it's coming up from renewal next year, um, you need to start working out how much more you might end up paying and planning ahead because there are lots of people who will face bills that are hundreds of pounds a month higher. And most people don't have a spare few hundred pounds a month or 500 pounds a month or something, for example. And with your savings, if you haven't moved your savings over the past six months, then it's time to think about doing that. Um, And the tools that you need to do this, this is money.co.uk forward slash mortgage hyphen finder. Go there, you can find out using your home's value and your loan size, what sort of mortgage rate you could end up with. And this is money.co.uk forward slash save, which is our independent Best Buy savings tables, where you will find all the best rates updated on a daily basis. And it's worth spending a little bit of time doing that and knowing, A, how much more you pay in your mortgage, and B, how much more you get in your savings. And then there's all these people listening to this going, I haven't got a mortgage, but I'd really quite like to buy a house. What about me? Mm. The good news is house prices what are about coming me? down. Yeah. Well, what about me? Yeah, what about you? <laughs> The good news is the house prices are coming down. The bad news is the mortgages to buy them have gone up. Mm. So it's not necessarily a, a net win for first-time buyers. When's the, the sweet spot coming for first-time buyers, Simon? Ooh, about 27 minutes time. Do you think? Yeah, if you don't hit that one, you're done for. It's like 10 years of waiting to buy. And I look, The thing at the moment is you can definitely negotiate a much better price on a property. We had nationwide figures out this week 
Uh, the average house price has fallen 15 and a half thousand pounds since the August peak. It's quite a big number. That's a 5.6% fall. Now, I would say that anybody putting their house on the market now is going to have to accept an offer for it to get it sold that is more than 5.6% below, below what they would have accepted back in summer. So I actually think that you, the real fall in house prices is bigger than that. Now, if you are a first time buyer and you're looking to buy, you're not in a chain, you don't have to sell anything, obviously. This is good news for you because you can negotiate much harder on the price of the property, especially if you've got your finances in order, but you do need to be able to get that mortgage. But, you know, the real hurdle for most people when it comes to buying is not necessarily the mortgage, it's the deposit. Um, so if the deposit reflects the house price, so maybe that helps them out. If the house price has come down, they, they've got a slightly bigger deposit than they thought, or, or they can, you know, they can make that work. And then when it comes to the mortgage, you're going to have to pass the affordability tests, which is difficult, particularly on these, these much higher rates. But in many cases, a lot of those people might be paying more in rent that they, than they would pay on the mortgage anyway, even with those higher rates. So it is worth looking into. I mean, obviously, be aware that house prices could continue to fall from here and probably are likely to because something has to give in this scenario. Um, but if you're buying somewhere that you're going to be happy in for the next five years, don't be careful about buying somewhere you'd only be happy in for the next two years. Make sure it's big enough. Make sure that if you do end up there for five years, you've got enough room and so on and so on. You know, if you're thinking of having a child, don't buy a one bedroom flat. All these things that you need to think through, then I'd say it's probably if you can get the mortgage a better time to be a first time buyer now than it was a year ago when prices were going bananas. All right. Well, you mentioned savings there, Simon. Shortly we'll be talking about ISAs. But first, another day, another state pension failure exposed by This Is Money. What would we do without Tanya and Sir Steve? The state pension records of people claiming universal credit are riddled with holes and the government has dodged the team's attempts to uncover the scandal. So, Tanya, what's the latest? What's this about? Well, the, the issue is that people who have um, been claiming universal credit have not had their national insurance records updated to reflect this. And this is this is very important because their their state pension is is dependent on it. And if their credits are not recorded properly, their records will look short. A lot of people won't even realise this. They'll look and they'll think that they're going to get less um, than they are. They might buy state pension top ups unwittingly and needlessly. And it might even influence when they decide to retire because it, it will affect their retirement finances. The system we've discovered for automatically updating this seems to either be, be broken or, or never worked since 2018. But millions of people have been on universal credit for various periods since then. And that's an awful lot of people who could have their state pension records completely wrong. The reason we we started looking into this is we actually just got a couple of questions into Steve Webb's column uh, and somebody came to him independently as well. So we potentially had three cases we were looking at and we weren't sure why. We didn't know at that stage that a lot of other people might be affected. So we just started asking questions and ran the story and asked if more people had been affected to come forward. We did a second story. Again, it was still a mystery. We were putting that it was a mystery in the headline because we, we didn't know what the cause was. And then we had five cases, so total seven by the end of last year. And then it really ramped up. I mean, lots and lots of people got in touch. And I ended up running 10 cases of people affected in the latest story. But the, the real turning point came when they started sending me letters uh, and an email that they'd had from junior DWP staff, which turned out to explain in some detail what exactly has gone wrong, that this system is broken, to the extent that the government's just manually updating people's records um, when they're with four, within four months of retirement, which is pretty late in the day. People have made all sorts of decisions before four months mm. before state pension age. And these junior officials really laid bare exactly what, what was going on. And up till then, the DWP and HMRC, who we've been, we've been asking questions of, had basically the first time told us there was no wider issue. And the second time put out some general statement about the vast majority of benefit claimants 
get their NI records updated. Well, that includes all sorts of other people as well who are, you know, have been on child benefit and all sorts of other benefits. So I felt that at the time that was really disingenuous and suspicious. So we, we challenged them about it. And some of the politicians have, have now got involved. When Wendy Chamberlain, who is the Lib Dems spokesman for work and pensions, immediately asked a question in the Commons about it when we published yesterday. And let's hope that they actually do something about it now, because people are incredibly concerned about mistakes on their state pension records. They want to get it sorted out and they Mm. do not wait, want to wait until they are literally on the verge of retirement to know what exactly they'll be getting. They want some certainty. Forgive me, Tanya. Is it obvious to find out if there's been an error made here? I mean, you said it started with one or two and then more came forward. Was it quite easy to find out that they had been affected? Well, people can look for themselves. They know when they've been on a universal credit and then they can look up their national insurance record and see if that is reflected on their national insurance record. After the end of the financial year, I believe Steve Steve will explain Mm. this more fully, but it's the following October after the end of the financial year that it should be updated. Um, So the current year, for instance, wouldn't show up at the moment. Um, But from there, you'll you'll be able to see if it's been reflected in your record. But the thing is, some people are on universal credit for short periods. So only some of it will show up on their record. And then they might have to buy top ups to fill in the rest of the gaps. Um, But they, they don't know that and they can't go ahead necessarily with that unless... Un- unless it's actually been recorded. And if it's not, um, we're at a loss, really. Steve, as, as Tanya said, you've been a partner with her on this investigation right from the start. When reader questions on this issue came into your weekly This Is Money column, you've been involved in every stage of the process. What is your take on what's gone wrong here and how the, the government should put it right for people? Well, I think, as is often the case, when you get a letter or an email about one case, you think, oh, this could just be a one off, you know, a clerical error, a single person. And you you look into it and then Tanya writes a story and then two or three or five or 10 people come forward and you start to think maybe there's something going on. And the department's press office say, no, no, nothing to see here. We, we've, we've been there before. Um, and I think what's a number of things are shocking really on this. I mean, so one of the case studies that Tanya doggedly pursued is a lady who's actually drawing her pension now. Mm. now. According to the government, even with all the mess they're talking about, they fix this before you retire. Well, not for this lady, they didn't. So she's just had 600 odd quid of back pension. So they've admitted they've underpaid her pension. We've got a set of people close to pension age who are thinking, well, I'm not going to get a full pension. Shall I spend some of my own money paying for national insurance when they didn't need to because it should have been on their record and as Tanya says leaving it to four months before you retire is is too late because you might have spent the money by then and I think that the the deeper issue is I mean the people told us time and again they asked the DWP what was going on they said oh nothing to do with us national insurance is an HMRC thing so they rang HMRC who said nothing to do with us this is universal credit go back to them so they put this on their universal credit diary thing and some you know, it's not fair to criticise the frontline staff. They they don't know, but they sort of, you know, had a guess, said, oh, search me. And eventually a few people asked the questions and we got these slightly conflicting letters to people saying, oh, there's never been a system, but we're working on it. This is a known problem, was a phrase that kept coming up. But you've got the people on the ground telling us it was a known problem and they were working to fix it. And the people in the press office and and the people who gave the press office the lines to take, telling them it was all fine and nothing to worry about. And, you know, there just hasn't been that openness on any of this, really. Steve, (laughs) I want to get you on one day. Can we talk about something good? Not set another (laughs) investigation into other things going wrong. How many more are out there? You do wonder, don't you? And I mean, I mean, you know, the the big state pension error that we've looked into, what alarms me is that that's still making mistakes today. I mean, they've got a thousand civil servants trying to fix all the past errors, but we get cases of people who've claimed their pension this month who are getting the wrong amount. And, you know, there just isn't the level of quality assurance and checking in this massive organisation. You know, because 1% error rate, most of us think 99% correct was pretty good. But if it's 1% of millions of people, that's you know, tens of thousands of people often. So I think, you know, th- my perception is that the Department for Work and Pensions has become a bit of a sort of bunker mentality. You know, any critic is an enemy. 
you know, fob them off, put them off. And what we actually need is transparency, because that's the best way to get this stuff sorted out. They could use us as a, like the canary in the, in the mine, you know, the early warning signal that something's not working, because we pick this stuff up. We're telling them about it, and their instinct is to close ranks and to push us away. And if it hadn't been for, for Tanya herself being so persistent and Simon and the this is the money team, Mrs. Money team, allowing the time to spend on this rather than just having to move on to the next story all the time, this stuff would still be going on. I wonder, Steve, and, and look, no disrespect to anyone in, in Department for Work and Pensions or even in HMRC or any government department, but I wonder when you deal with sort of numbers on a screen that it doesn't really feel that real. But the two of you deal with real people and cases all the time. So tell us, like, how is this materially impacting people? Well, certainly, I mean, the, the, the emails convey the frustration of being passed from pillar to post. And often, of course, you don't just phone a number and speak to a person. You phone a number, go through 15 menus and on hold music for 45 minutes, you know, only to be cut off or told to go and ring somebody else. So it's just the frustration. And people do, you know, I mean, Tanya has, I think, probably spoken to many of these people. I've largely seen the emails, but they just, you know, the frustration of dealing with a big bureaucracy. Um, and, and there is this sense, I think, because DW deals in such large numbers of people that that, that people become fractions of a percent mm. rather than you know customers so how many people do you think are going to be affected by this steve well i mean there were last summer there were nearly five million people on universal credit oh my word and the gov website says they automatically get national insurance credits well we don't think they do automatically you know now the government would say well you know if you're 35 and you're missing some credits doesn't really matter because you'll probably fill the gap some other way and it'll be sorted by the time you retire and there's, there's some truth in that but if it's not automatic they ought to say so and that we don't we're not convinced they are picking people up systematically just before they retire we've certainly come across gaps in that process so really need you know some some fresh air and disinfectant on all of this you know some openness so we can see what's Indeed. going on before we bookend this, Steve, um, where are we at with it? What's DWP said? What's the latest? Well, frustratingly, I mean, they did. They apologised for the 10 cases that Tanya has highlighted and they fixed all of them. <laughs> you know, so with 10 down, as it were, 4.8 million to go, probably. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's good now that MPs have got involved. So in, in Tanya's story, she mentioned various Labour MPs who'd asked questions and the written answers they got back were, were unsatisfactory. A question was asked in the House uh, this week and, and, you know, a reply was promised. So I think hopefully the MPs who shadow DWP have now got the bit between their teeth and will hold, you know, doggedly hold on to this, ask questions, raise debates until it gets sorted. And yeah, I mean, Steve was talking there about people buying national insurance contributions, as it were, years voluntarily. What should you be thinking about before you do that? You, you really... It? Oh, yes, it it is definitely worth it. And Steve's written a whole guide to trying to work out whether it's, you know, how much it's worth your while and how to fill in the gaps. It is quite complicated, though, because you have to have a good grasp of your own record and whether it's worth it for your individual situation. I think the best thing to do is for people to look at Steve's guide. We can try and get it in the in the show notes. But actually, in the um, main story that we've just done on, on this, there is a link to it in a box so people can find it by that but it's an individual situation but you can get your you obviously have to live long enough to benefit from buying voluntary top-ups but you can get the money back that you've you know your outlay relatively quickly and it is definitely um, something to think about Uh, we understand though that a lot of people have got queries in with the DWP asking if it's worth their while and I have to have a bit of sympathy with them there if everyone's asking you is it worth my while individually then they probably can't cope with the volumes of this. That is why I think the, the web page that Steve created to help people through the process is an invaluable help to at least know when you get started whether it's going to be a benefit to you. Steve, is the system just all a bit too complicated now? Too many questions need to be asked of DWP that just can't cope or is it the personnel have been taken off and redirected somewhere else or what? What is the root cause of all of these issues that seem to be happening? I think sometimes the complexity is with the best of intentions. I mean, if you think about the issue we started with, we've got a brand new benefit trying to bring six benefits into one. So, you know, income support, housing benefit, tax credits have all been rolled into universal credit. So the goal was a simpler system. And in fact, giving 4.8 million people automatic national insurance credits is great. 
you know, both partners in a joint claim get it. You know, if, that, if it works, it's tremendous. It's just that kind of how you engage with the system when it, when it doesn't work. And I think there is an issue about staffing because, you know, uh, politicians always say, oh, we're going to cut bureaucracy. And, you know, of course, there are no doubt pen pushers in all organisations, but there's an awful lot of people who are answering the phone, dealing with the public, processing claims for tens of millions of people and tens of millions of claims. You just need a lot of people to do that. And if you don't pay them particularly well and you're always trying to sort of cut things and, you know, people get demoralised, you know, people shout at them on the phone. It's not great you know, often to, you know, to be on the other end of all of this. It, you know, so, so I think in a way. You do need the people to make the system work. You can't keep making cuts. But I think coming back to my point, if you just had openness, because things will go wrong and you'll pick them up quicker and you can put them right rather than just be defensive and pretend there isn't a problem. Steve, thank you so much for your time coming on and explaining all that. I want to say we look forward to seeing you again, Steve, but let's hope we see you again for better news. I'll think of some cheery, cheery topics to talk to you about. Do indeed. Thank you very much, Steve. That's it for part one. I'm joined now by Sam North for our weekly look at what's been going on on the markets. Sam, it's been a week that's been dominated by interest rate decisions, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it has. Uh, Central banks across the board rose interest rates, the Bank of England, up to 4% uh, with a 50 basis point hike, although it does seem we're getting closer to the terminal rate. The ECB also by 50 basis point, although their peak rate X is expected to be later in the year, whereas the Fed just by 25 basis point. And some people actually reckon that is the last rate hike from their markets like that. And we had a great January. Uh, the first 21 trading days of the year were uh, the best eight. Well, it was in the top eight of all time, which is incredible. The S&P 500 also had the jobs report literally just now, which showed signs that the US isn't in a recession and the Fed hasn't completely broken the market yet. Uh, also, just to make it even a bigger week, we also had some earnings from Apple, Amazon and Google, although they did report a week at Outlook. So that might just be a little bit of a spanner in the works. But we've had a great start to the year and, and, and fingers crossed it can continue. So an optimistic January turned into February. What do we have to look forward to next week? Yeah, as is always the case after a US jobs report like we had today, the Monday and Tuesday are are pretty quiet. Uh, But then we do get a few macro events from around the world, which are worth taking interest in. The RBA policy decision, UK GDP and Chinese inflation. The week after, a lot busier. But those events will be enough to create some noise. Uh, Also, this week was bigger for earnings, but next week there are a few companies to keep an eye on. Walt Disney, Uber, Pepsi, Toyota, PayPal, all report as well. Uh, but yeah, fingers crossed, as I was saying, that this year is, is going to be similar to January. When January is positive, the stock market finishes higher uh, for the year, around about 70% of the time. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Right, we'll catch up with you next week. Thanks very much, Sam. Thanks, Simon. Welcome back. Now, if you want to protect your hard-earned savings interests or investment gains from the taxman, then it is wise to consider an ISA. It's effectively a shield that protects savings or investments from tax. And with savings rates rising and a capital gains tax and dividend tax rate on the horizon, an ISA makes even more sense than before. Now, there are five types of ISA you can get as an adult cash, stocks and shares, lifetime and an innovative finance ISA plus one. Specifically for children, the junior ISA, the team of Pull together a quick guide to help you decide. Simon Isis, why are they so good? You mentioned savings earlier. Why are they so good? And why now specifically? Why now specifically? Because this year it's even more important to think about getting your investments or your savings into an ISA than it has been in the past. The reason is that, firstly, savings rates have gone up. Everybody has a personal savings allowance. That's £1,000 that they can get savings interest tax free. Unless they are a higher rate taxpayer. So if you pay 40% tax, you see that savings allowance slashed to £500. Hitting that £500 has got a lot easier due to the rise in savings rates. So there's going to be more people finding out that they are being dragged into the savings tax net. And that's something that you want to avoid doing because let's face it, after all those years of rubbish returns on your savings, you don't want to be giving more than you have to to the tax man, particularly as that stern schoolmaster, Mr. Hunt, has ripped up naughty schoolboy Quasi Quartengs 
imaginative homework and said, no, sunshine, we're not having tax cuts. We are having tax rises. And he's hitting us all with some hikes. So be careful about your savings. Um, get them into an ISA and then they're totally tax free. You don't need to worry about it. Rates on ISAs are a bit lower than rates on standard accounts, but it's still probably worth doing. Also, think about the premium bonds. We've spoken about this recently. Premium bond price rates gone up. They are also tax free. Investments. Now, here's the real crunch one. On your investments, on your profits, you have to pay capital gains tax. And on the dividends you get, you have to pay dividend tax. Now, as part of the aforementioned raid on our finances, Jeremy Hunt has decided in his wisdom to slash the capital gains tax-free allowance from £12,300 a year to £6,000 a year as of April. That is a big drop. So any profits you make above £6,000 in any given year from selling assets and you make a capital gain, you're going to have to start paying tax on that. And then from the year after, he's taken it all the way down to three to three thousand pounds. Dividends, the dividend allowance falling from two thousand to one thousand to five hundred pounds. Now, bear in mind that small investors getting dividends have really been hammered by uh, an unintended consequence of them trying to crack down on people paying themselves dividends when they run limited companies rather than paying income tax. And I think that that is actually deeply unfair, that the dividend tax rate on small investors. But I don't think the capital gains tax rate is a particularly good one either. Um, so you need to get your investments into an ISA because then you avoid having to deal with any of this stuff. You won't have to pay capital gains tax on any profits. You won't have to pay dividend tax on any dividends. The money that you make can get rolled up. It can compound over the years and you'll get lots, lots more. The reason why you need to think about this now is because potentially people who have investments outside of ISAs, and there are lots of those people actually, might have capital gains that they've made that it would be a very good idea to crystallise, as it's known, before the end of the tax year, whilst they've got that bigger allowance. So you sell your shares, your funds, your investment trusts, you bank your profit, and then you can buy back into those same uh, stocks, funds, trusts within an ISA. It's called, it, this is a, called a, a bed and ISA in the industry. And the advantage of that is that the taxman doesn't have a problem with it. Whereas if you just sell them and then buy them straight back in a normal standard trading or general investment account, the taxman says, no, 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 I see what you're doing here. Um, you you're meant to wait a period of time before you do that. But you can do this into an ISA. And what it also means is that you're using up this year's ISA allowance before the new one starts in April. And the ISA allowance is £20,000, which is a lot. Most people can't put £20,000 a year into an ISA. But it's a use it or lose it affair. So if you use the bit that you can to do that with those capital gains this year, then you get to use some of that allowance that you might not be able to fulfil in full. And then all of your gains from now on are tax-free. And we've just started up our ISA investing channel again. This is money.co.uk forward slash ISA investing, where we're going to be covering lots of stuff about investing in ISAs, uh, saving in ISAs and all these things over the next few months in the run up to April. And really, the key thing is it's now February and you just don't leave this stuff to the last minute. Human nature, everybody leaves stuff to the last minute. You've probably only just done your tax return, haven't you? Um, but you know, don't leave it to the last minute. Do this stuff now because then it gives you time to plan and also time to deal with it if anything goes wrong or you forget to do something. Tanya, ISA tips, you a fan? Um, I've just um, moved my savings ISA, actually. I found a good transfer in deal. One of my savings colleagues advised me on this is money. And from having a really absolutely derisory rate, I've now got not the absolute top market rate, but a decent rate that I, I don't have to fume over anymore. Um, I feel much better about that now. When it comes to investing, what I tend to do, and this is also something people need to think about in the run up to the April deadline, is I tend to uh, top up my pension and get the extra tax relief in, as opposed to run a sort of separate investing investing ISA. Basically, you invest through your 
your pension, the, the charges don't tend to be cheaper because your pension firm has got more buying power when a no, negotiating power than you do when it comes to setting the charges for them. Plus, you get this tax relief. So anything that I was uh, I want to invest, I'm going to put in extra lump sums into the pension to benefit from that. All right, then. So that's it. Get your skates on for ISIS. Uh, finally, tumble dryers. The most power-guzzling contraptions in our home. Or are they? New energy-efficient models could change all that. Simon, explain. Tumble dryers. Tumble dryers. They're evil, I aren't they? It, they, I they? I haven't got they one in my new flat. wicked. No, I miss you? mine. Miss it. I do not know what we would do without our tumble dryers. My dryer. towels are like cardboard. Yeah, if you I try mean, and dry them on the radiator doesn't just doesn't work. I know, I know it does. It, it really does soften up the towels, but it's not just that. It means your house isn't full of, or your flat isn't full of washing constantly. We're not all lucky enough to have utility rooms. I've got kind of like a utility shack that's basically this um, bit built off the back of our garage uh, that the previous owners of the house had, but it's got unfortunately it's got no heating in it. Um, so you cannot dry clothes in there uh, for the you know six months of the year because if you try to, they just get that sort of smelly, damp, haven't dried properly thing going on. And as a family with you know two adults and two children in it, we seem to produce an inordinate amount of washing. And yeah, I, I don't know what we would do without our tumble dryer because we have enough washing hanging around the house as it is let alone giving up on the tumble dryer. But maybe you don't need to feel as bad about your tumble dryer as you would do because energy efficient models are dramatically cheaper. In fact, the difference in running costs between an older model and the most efficient new ones can be hundreds of pounds a year. So there is a suggestion that they could pay for themselves relatively quickly. Um, so uh, you switch. Uh, found a £479 A++ rated Hoover heat pump dryer. Costs about £88 per year to run, based on two uses per week. I wish we only used our tumble dryer twice a week. By contrast, a £280 Hoover vented dryer with a C energy rating costs £216 per year. So basically there's three types of tumble dryer. A vented tumble dryer. These uh, expel hot air via a tube and they tend to be the cheapest type to buy, but the least energy efficient. Condenser tumble dryers convert hot air into water, which collects in a tank and needs to be emptied. They cost roughly the same to run as vented dryers, according to the experts here, but I think they probably are a little bit cheaper. And then heat pump dryers recycle hot air, meaning they use much less energy, but they can take slightly longer to dry clothes. So they cost roughly 74p per cycle. But you will obviously have to buy a new dryer and it will cost you money. But this is potentially one of those things where buying a more energy efficient uh, appliance actually will pay off. There are many other scenarios where buying a more energy efficient appliance will take you many decades yeah. to get your money back. But I think that this might actually be one of the ones where it is a bit of a winner. But yeah, tumble dryers, they really divide people, don't they, on the whole like, I can never use my tumble dryer or I can't live without my tumble dryer. Dry drying your body with a piece of cardboard every day and then you change your mind to tell you. Right, that's it. Thank you very much for clearing that up. Uh, thank you very much to Tanya and to Steve, of course, and to you for listening. You can keep up to date with all the latest breaking money news. Just go to thisismoney.co.uk or download the app. And if you have any comments or questions for the team or anything you'd like them to look into, Simon. Uh, you can email us at editor at thisismoney.co.uk. You can tweet us at thisismoney and you can come to thisismoney.co.uk forward slash podcast to find all podcasts past and join in the debate in reader comments and if you like our podcast why not rate us wherever you found us it helps other people find us too don't forget you can stay on top of what's going on in the markets by tuning in to the digest and invest podcast by Toro. go to your regular podcast platform and listen on the go digest and invest by Toro, the podcast for those interested in trading and investing